That's pretty cool, actually. I never knew you could do this in Zoom. Yeah. Well, that's what people have been doing every time, like you see broadcasts of Zoom meetings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Okay, so I think you're okay. probably good if you want to start the PowerPoint. All right, sounds good. I can just uh, exit this. Yeah, probably. Would you like to start us off? Yeah. All right, guys. So, of course, you guys have heard about the Diocl Diocletianic or Diocletianic persecutions. I'm sure uh, that, that was the topic of uh, last week and early Christian persecutions. Uh, which would cover basically the persecutions uh, during the Roman era. So by the Romans on their citizens, who some of them are Christians. Uh, but these persecutions, you probably didn't know, were actually dwarfed, or maybe you did, the, by the persecutions during the medieval era. And uh, so that's what we're going to focus on today. And we're only going to focus mostly on like the eastern side, because that's sort of the side that's most relevant. So the eastern Mediterranean, such as Egypt, what happened in uh, Palestine and in, in like the sort of the Eastern world. Um, okay. So first we have to take stock. Here's sort of like an outline of what we're going to cover. We're going to start off in the 500s or the sixth century, and we're going to sort of move on century by century. And we're going to speed through the last few until we get to 1453. A lot of things happened in between all of like during this whole period. And it's like, it's a travesty to cover this much time in such a short presentation, but I feel like it's a really important thing to get an overview, a historical and uh, just, just a, a, a firm knowledge of what happened during this time to understand like the persecution, because all of this is really relevant. You can't just talk about one thing unless you have like the background you know, of that thing. So like the context, and that's, that's our goal today. So first, we're going to take stock of what we first had. So the beginning, like at the very beginning, before these persecutions took place in the medieval era, medieval era, what did we have? So what what uh, what was the country like back then? Uh, who are the people? What did they believe in? And uh, well, why they weren't persecuted, or why there was very minimal persecution? There was persecution, but it wasn't the same type of the persecution that was later seen in the medieval era. So we're going to continue our discussion and go through like a rabbit hole. Uh, into the seventh century, the seventh and the eighth, going all the way to like the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh century, the late eleventh century, and then we're gonna conclude with a talk on or a brief word on what happened on the year fourteen fifty three. It's a very, very important pivotal event. It's you, many of you might know it, but we, you know, it's uh, one of the most influential events, other than the you know probably the the, the life of Christ in the entire world. Um, Okay, so let's get let's get started. There we go. Okay. So first, we're going to talk about the Orthodox nation. We're in the fifth five hundreds right now, and the Orthodox nation is a country that professed one God, one, and it was one country, and there was one ruler, one emperor. The country was harboring the spirit of God in the creation of the Orthodox creed. So we know in. Nicene Creed was created or written by uh, a council in the year 320... 325. Thank you. I was thinking about 324 for another thing. So 325. Of course, this was written through the minds of the most brilliant citizens of the time and uh, through, the, through, the, whole, through the, the grace of the Holy Spirit. So this country where this creed was written was called Romania, uh, otherwise known as the Roman Empire. So they called themselves Romania back then. We call them the Roman Empire. We also call them by a whole other host of names. I'm just going to stick with one name, the Roman Empire. So around the year 500 AD, the country had much of its, re of its territory lost. Like they lost France, for example. They lost Italy, their core, their core province. And they lost Spain and Africa, like money-making provinces. And it was a pretty devastating time. So the, the, the 400s, people would say that's when Rome fell. 476, that's when Rome fell. No, not really. Rome was surviving and thriving in the East. It's just the Western provinces that were conquered. Um, in the year 500, a new emperor, in the, year, in the 500s, early 500s, a new emperor took power. His name was Justinian. And he started a sort of a quest to liberate the peoples of the West. So he wanted to take back what was lost. So Italy, Spain, Africa. He wanted to take it all back, but unfortunately, this is the most he could do for various reasons, such as bubonic plagues, you know, a plague that killed like a third of the population. 
and, uh, and uh, other wars in the East, so with Persia. So we know that this country had like a population of around 50 million, give or take. We can't really know for sure the number, but 50 million is one of the given estimates for 500 and 540s, just before the plague hit in the 545, 546 time. So uh, it also had the highest GDP globally, which means it had the strongest economy. And a lot of that had to do with its possession of Egypt. Very crucial because Egypt controlled huge trading networks going all the way to like the Far East and India and China. So it was very, like, Egypt was like one of the money makers, the breadbasket and the money maker for the empire. So it was a very, very important province. And of course, this nation was firmly Orthodox in faith. They were like Orthodox to almost to a fault because obviously they had councils, frequent councils to discuss the faith. When it was a heresy, it was, it was uh, a big deal. Like anyone saying something that's her heretical in any sense would be a big deal. So, you know, there is Arius, obviously, and um, Nestor, Nestorius. Um, and each one of these, each one of these heresies would warrant like a council, like it would warrant like uh, the emperor himself, the leader of that country calling for the, the greatest minds, the greatest theological minds of the time to convene and discuss this issue. They were adamant on unity. They wanted to make sure their Orthodox faith was unshaken. They wanted, they wanted everything to be solid. So um, it was in this country that almost all of what we know on theology, like we always go back to the church fathers, the church fathers, the church fathers. And of course there's more than the church fathers, but they're sort of our core because well, like, you know, the, the, like they, they were pretty good. And this was all uh, obviously like this theology was all discovered by the will of the Holy Spirit. And they were like next level Christians. So we always go back to them. And yeah, so this country is where these people lived, essentially. Of course, um, after Constantine and the conversion, this country became, so I already mentioned that they became fairly Orthodox and the official languages were Latin and Greek. So originally it was only Latin. And then the intermediate period when Justinian was reigning, they made both Latin and Greek official. And then after like the Arab invasions, the Muslim invasions, which we're going to talk about later, uh, it became only Greek. So let's delve in, let's dive, have a small, you know, dive into a rabbit hole uh, on this nation, sort of gauge what, what it was. And, and uh, because we were part of it, our ancestors were part of it. So sort of like who, where we came from and sort of who we were in the past. Sorry, yeah. I'm a little bit confused. You keep speaking of a country and a nation, and you're using those two words almost like synonymously. Hmm. And on the map, I see many different things highlighted. What do you? What do you? Is this? Is this a single country, or is are we talking about? What are we talking about here? We're talking about a single country. Yeah, yeah the Roman Empire. The so Roman Empire is considered a single country. Yes. So everything that's highlighted there is one country. Is one country. Yeah. Even though Egypt is highlighted. Yeah, this was all one country. So you're saying under the Roman Empire, Egypt wasn't considered Egypt, it was considered the Roman Empire. Yes. Oh, interesting. So there is all of these places where you, you could today call Turkey, Egypt, Syria, Palestine, Algeria, Tunis, Libya, Italy, Greece, Macedonia, or North Macedonia, uh, Serbia, all of these places, Bulgaria, Spain, Morocco, these are all one country in this period. So like it was just one nation, every country had its governor, every country, uh, well, not every country, every province would have its governor and every province would have its administration. And during this time, actually, it was it was after the Diocletian reform. So everything was sort of homogenous. It was, there was no more Pharaoh, there was no more like local kings and local government structures. It was all under one unified system, efficient system. Um, there's a lot of actually history behind that, but we're, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of like fast track our way through it. I'll try my best to avoid going on a lot of tensions just so uh, we could like, like really understand like the persecution that happened after this time. So at the very center of this nation was its great capital. You would know it, of course, as Constantinople. Uh, some people called it New Rome. Other people, mainly the citizens, would just call it the city. You know, they just call it police, the city. Police isn't the Greek word for the city. So the great, this, uh, I think, was the greatest city of all time. And it was a city between half a million to one million citizens. So it depends on the time zone and like, you know, where I go after the plague, it sort of got decimated. But uh, before the plague, it, it was basically approaching Rome level status of one million citizens at its peak. It was pretty intense. And this is just a depiction of it. it's a very beautiful depiction. You could see the great church of holy wisdom in the background there. Next to it is the church of uh, 
uh, the uh, Church of Saint Irene, Hagia Irene. And then there's like, you can see all the columns and all the buildings, tall buildings. These are like, you know, they knew what they were doing back then. You can see in the foreground, you can see a bit of the boats and behind the boats, you can see the, the walls, the sea walls and the harbor front. Uh, it's pretty intense. And uh, this was the capital, the, the center of government for this one country that we just saw in the sixth century. So imagine that no electricity and uh, they were able to accomplish so much from just their, the work of their hands, basically. So Constantinople was the capital, uh, the capital was a highly developed urbanized center containing the administrative government ruling over this vast territory. So just a zoomed out view of what it looked like. In the East here, you have actually Persia. This would be like the, the great rival of the Roman Empire. And then you have many, many various tribes and small nations that surround these areas, but they weren't as important as like, there's three na main nations. There's the Romans, the Persians, and the, uh, the, the Chinese in the East, the Far East. Those are like the three main groups during this time period. So within this territory, you have many great urban centers. You don't just have Constantinople, which is like right in the middle, sort of the top middle right here. So you have also in Egypt, you have like Alexandria, for example, and you have a lot of big cities in, in Egypt. You have Jerusalem and Palestine. They called it a different by a different name, but uh, they know they knew it as Jerusalem. The people knew it. And then you have Antioch. Uh, you have Carthage, which was in Africa, was sort of where Tunis is. Obviously, you have Rome during this time. Rome was not as as uh, important during this time because everything sort of shifted towards the east when Constantinople became the new capital, uh, and like many many like big cities. So you're talking like 50 million people approximately in this area here. So life was generally good before things like the bubonic plague war and barbarian invasion took all, uh, you know, took its toll. And in the early 500s, people enjoyed a time of prosperity and peace. Churches were being built across the empire in droves. So Justinian is like the one who enacted, like he, he's the one who initiated lots of building projects. You know, obviously the, the uh, we call it the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. That was his building. This was his baby, sort of his, his, but many churches like this on a similar scale, maybe not as big, were built across the whole empire. Like every urban center, every major, ur major urban center had like a colossal church, like a church in every place. Obviously they, they don't exist today for reasons we're going to describe very soon, but uh, like this is just a testimony to the great wealth and power of this nation, of this country. They were very Christ-centric. Like it wasn't the World Trade Center in the middle of a city, it was a cathedral church. And this was like the center. On Sunday, everyone would go to the cathedral church. They wouldn't go party, they wouldn't go on business. They'd go to the center, they would go to the cathedral church. And people enjoyed this time of prosperity and peace. It was incredible. It was it was a great time to live, a great time to be alive. Of course, for Egyptians, sometimes we would, there's obviously people would say that, uh, that well, now this was after the Council of Chalcedon. There's a division between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. Chalcedon, right, there's the whole thing about the nature of Christ. So there was like the people who said, we're heretics. You know, the, the, uh, the sort of the Greek speaking people, they call us heretics and be like, oh, uh, you guys believe like Christ had uh only one nature and they'd be like oh we're not gonna get into those details i'm going on a tangent <laughs> but yeah so that actually did cause some resentment between groups of people within the, the nation within the country but like it also it wasn't like persecution on the okay we're gonna go kill all these people sort of thing they tried everyone tried to reconcile there's so many reconciliation attempts in fact justinian his wife theodora was um we my office essentially uh, i would call my offset is like the word we would use to describe ourselves, but like she was like basically what you would say Coptic in a way. Right. So in the like she was like arguing with her with her husband and like let's try and she was the one. There was a story and I'm going on another tangent I know, uh, but Pope Suidas, anyways, um, she tried. There was there was an attempt by Justinian's wife Theodora to reconcile the churches again. Before that, the the previous emperor, one of the previous emperors, was. Uh, the emperor Anastasios, great guy. He actually made a lot of money <laughs> for the empire. He's sort of the guy who sort of made it possible for Justinian to build all these churches. But uh, Anastasios was my office. Like, you see, like, even though the Council of Chalcedon did cause a division, it was sort of a mix, a big mix. Like, there are people who are opposed and people who are against this whole decision to cast off. People sort of saw it for what it was and like, yeah, this doesn't, this is not right. And people who are like adamant. So like, no, we're, 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 we're here into the council of council decision and final. We're not going to, we're not going to go back on that. So that's sort of the state of affairs at the time. 
of course, there had to be people to defend this. So you, I'm talking about a great nation and a great country and there's a lot of churches and, oh, well, how about all the, the threats from abroad? Well, you had the Roman army, which was still at this time powerful. And it learned and adapted from all the defeats that it suffered in the previous century. So, you know, it lost most of its territory, but it regained a lot of that territory in the, in the 6th century, in the mid-6th century. So, obviously, they were still a force to be reckoned with. They were charged with defense of the borders, charged with uh, defensive fighting, charged with liberation of occupied lands, and charged with protection of the citizenry. So, they would be the guys who, would, they call it the limitani. They would be the guys who would literally just stand there on the forts and look out into the horizon, making sure that there's no enemy. And if there's an enemy, they'd call it in and then the army would come in. So it's pretty intense. They, they were a very efficient fighting force. If you look at the US army today, that's sort of like how you, other nations would see the Roman army in the past at that time. They'd be like, yeah, these guys are the best, done. Like they're, the, they're at the very top. They spend the most on the military, they're at the very top. And that's sort of how it was back then. Obviously, the country had really no rivals in the fields of engineering and medicine. The closest rival you would really get to is Persia. They, they were pretty good, too. Um, um, and obviously, the Romans, they took advantage of millennia of scientific discoveries over, like, several civilizations. Remember, they had Egypt under their control. So all of the Egyptians, like, discoveries and all that stuff, they were there in the books. Like, whatever wasn't burnt during the centuries was there for the taking. So they were able to, to leverage all of that. Uh, the Egyptians, some of the, the stuff from the Babylonians, the Persians, all of that stuff was in the territory of the Romans at that time. And obviously there was access to libraries in other countries and they had spies. Justinian was very good with spies. He sent spies all the way to, to China to steal silkworms. So, and uh, that's a different story. And, and again, it's a bit off on a tangent, so I'm gonna cut that short. So a strong, strong organization demands strong leadership. And this mosaic actually gives you an example of how real life a real life Roman commander would have looked like, uh, what he would have worn and uh, what, how his soldiers would interact with him. Obviously it's the guy in the, in the middle and then the guys around him, you know, the guys like, you know, telling him, hey, look, there's something going on, come see. Uh, and of course you could notice the hat. Um, that is no coincidence. That's a tradition that lives on to this day. And at the very top, of course, you had the Roman emperor himself. This is a painting of Emperor Justinian. And he was, you know, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they consider him a saint. We don't really care too much about him other than what, like, he did to try, or his wife did to try to reconcile with the, reconcile the churches again. But, uh, yeah, I thought it was a really cool painting, actually, someone's painting. It's a really good depiction. It looks very similar to what, it's probably exactly what he would have looked like, according to, like, the mosaics and the cathedrals and churches in, uh, in Ravenna. Ravenna, another tangent. So, we really should get a sense of how life was in this nation, uh, what it would have been like, and like you know how it would have felt like to live there. So here are some stills to illustrate daily life in the capital. Here's one. Notice the church. That's the great church of the Holy Wisdom in the background. Uh, the people, the bustling streets, the banners, all of the the columns and the statues at top of the columns. Look at the density of the buildings, the apartment complexes, the houses, the forms, the columns, lots and lots of columns everywhere. This is like the, the this is called the form of Constantine. That would be where people would come on a Saturday to conduct business, like sell their livestock and, and trade certain things and like a big market, essentially. And here's the main street. It's called the Messi. And well, I bet it wasn't actually like this with foot traffic. <laughs> like it seemed like, a, you know, they'd clog up all the roads for all the, you know, the, the, the horse carriages and the, the camels and whatnot. But uh, it was a it, you, you, it does tell you that it was busy. It was a sprawling metropolis. And this would essentially have been downtown Constantinople. So could you really believe that these buildings existed 1500 years ago? Like when I look at pictures like this, I'm like, no way they built these. No way, 1500 years ago is ancient. That's like history. That's so far back. A country that's this ancient was this developed to create these things that we today would struggle to create something similar. We, we do create something similar, but it's never in the scale and beauty of something like this. It's like, we always try to copy them, just make things that look like that. Of course, defense of this was all key. The city of Constantinople was defended by a triple circuit wall. So three levels of walls. And outside of that, there was a moat. So basically, you cannot get in if your life depended on it. Like you either die in the moat, pass, pass the first wall and die there, or you won't even be able to pass the third wall because it's so high up, you can't climb it. So it's basically impenetrable. And it proved time and time again, impossible to breach. And now some of the people. 
I'm just gonna look at the like the higher level people because that's sort of like the where the portraits. When you look at the portraits of the, of people in the past, you always see the portraits of the emperors. So here is just depictions or modern modern day uh, representations of how these people would have looked like. So these are some of the emperors. To the left, you have Constantine, and then you have a few more emperors. Um, you have here some of the empresses. Of course, their hairstyles were probably nothing to brag about, but maybe that's for our standards. <laughs> Yeah, I have no idea what's going on to the left there, but <laughs> a few more pictures. And the one to the right is actually the Emperor Theodosius, and he was the overseer of the Council of Constantinople, the Second Council. So that's a little bit of history. That's a little bit of sort of our early history, where we came from, the Christian nation, the Orthodox nation, the country. So, so you know, like, where is it now? It's gone. What happened? The Great Debacle. This is the next topic. Now we have a sense of what, what sort of what we had our ancestors, what they were living in, our country, our Orthodox nation, a place of devotion and life for the sake of the church, for the sake of the country, ultimately for the sake of Christ and his creation. That's how it summarized the existence of that country. Of course, uh, this couldn't last. And uh, it all started with a huge war. There is a massive war in, in the early seventh century. Of course, you guys have heard it because we celebrate a feast of the cross that commemorates an event that was within this war. So. Um, no, we'll talk about that actually after. But the, after the war, the depleted country, the two depleted countries, Persia and Rome, got savagely attacked. And finally, many millions of Romans, approximately half the population, I would say, maybe a little less, fell under new management. And we're, that's, this is when things start to get a bit scary and a bit, uh, this is when the, when the persecution starts to really show its face, its ugly face. Well, first there is the great Roman Persian war which lasted between the six, uh, six, early 600s to 628. It was a long, it was exhaustive, and it was devastating. Uh, Jerusalem was sacked. They basically took it, the Persians, they took it, they invaded the Roman Empire, took Jerusalem, destroyed it because they resisted. That's sort of how they treated everything. Not only that, they managed to take Egypt. So each of the breadbasket, the most important province of the Roman Empire was taken, was under the control of the Persians during this time. Anyways, the Persian capital was also under the brink of collapse and destruction because the Romans had to retaliate. The Romans did everything. The Emperor Heraclius at the time, he did everything to, to, to fight, to fight back. He wanted to defend his country. So he raised a whole lot of money, uh, which involved melt, melting all the silverware, using all, like asking the churches politely to forfeit all their silverware so that they could be melted into money, money that we could actually, uh, that ex still exists to this day. And uh, you can actually like look at it and see it in museums and stuff. It's pretty cool. But uh, you know, the, the surrounding events that, that caused the money to be minted is not that cool. Anyways, he went in, he invaded Persia. So while Persia was occupying Egypt and Palestine and all that, he invaded Persia and laid waste to their territory. Sort of been trying to force them to get back, try to force them out of the Roman territory. He went as far as going to the capital, Tessaphon, and laying siege. But as soon as he laid siege, the, the Persian king like panicked his family panicked and killed him and appointed a new guy in his place and sued for peace with the romans so like, like it was pretty bad now, that's sort of how the, the the war ended the generals didn't want to just go so easily so the romans had to go back and uh sort of fight them in their own territory but that's at the end it was there was no victor it was a colossal loss for both countries it was terrible it was actually a catastrophe of course, we know that we we know this war because of the one of the feasts of the cross, which we commemorate a key event. A key event. Does anyone uh, maybe uh, you know, ask someone to volunteer if they know this key event? One of the feasts of the cross. I'll give you a hint. So the, the first one is the, the 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 first one we celebrate is the actually finding of the true cross by Saint Helen, and then the second was the return of the cross, the return of the cross to Jerusalem. This is from Persia during this war. So when they took Jerusalem, they took all the holy things, basically, all the things that seemed important, you know, that are adorned with gold and jewels. So they took all that stuff into the Persian territory and just sort of like, I don't know, buried it. And um, when the Romans went in, they were looking for this. They knew that these things were gone. These things were, were precious, obviously, the relics. So they went in and they found them. And they brought up the, the cross being like the main thing, the big thing. They brought it back to Jerusalem, and there was a huge celebration about this. It was it was it was incredible. We we, we celebrate a feast to this day, of for this event. And well, of course, all of that came out of a colossal 
cost because the Roman army was depleted. The treasure was depleted. Both our empires were exhausted. There, no one had any will to fight at that point. And well, there is basically lots and lots of wealth laying there undefended, undefended within these two nations. And these people, there were people taking notes, looking north and taking north notes. Interesting, what's going on? This could be an opportunity. And when they saw the opportunity, they, the opportunity, they acted. And this is when we have the Muslim invasion of the Persian and Roman empires. Simultaneous, they just attacked. They just went, went for it. They saw the loot and they saw the booty up there and just went for it. Crazy. And this is when things just get absolutely, like, now it's going to be the most depressing thing that you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> so we started with amazing stuff, and then we're going to go into something that's a bit, uh, like, not so great. And when I first read about this stuff, I was devastated. I was crying, and I, like, literally, I was, like, up, up, upset about this. I was angry. I was, like, how could this happen? <laughs> but, yeah, like, things happen. <laughs> so the Muslims invaded, and uh, I can only just imagine what was going through their minds when they approached the great Limus Arabicus, which is sort of the border defenses uh, at, the, at, the, at the border of the Roman Empire, sort of where like the red begins. They had a big frontier border there. Diocletian built it. And uh, I could just imagine, you know, they're, they're coming with their, with their swords and there's, they see this huge wall and they're like, yeah, I'm going there. <laughs> so they went, they crossed into the territory, the most feared nation in the entire globe at the time. And the invasions were actually catastrophic as we know, you know, uh, from our present situation strings of defeats they were losing constantly like defeat after defeat they sent an army defeated they sent an army destroyed people were getting killed left and right cities were getting conquered defeat after defeat and cities were falling in their droves syria palestine and then egypt fell within 10 years africa and spain followed soon after and this is sort of like the command that's what they were given this was like the sort of the underlying concept that drove them to do what they were doing. Fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who consider unlawful, who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of the truth from those who are given the scripture. Fight until they, they give the jizya and willing, willingly while they are humble. So this is their, their sort of, you know, their, their, their governing phrase. This is what they would do. That's why they invaded it wasn't a defensive war they weren't fighting because someone fought them no they fought because they found they wanted to fight they wanted to take all of this over they wanted to dominate the world so first the persian empire fell completely and it was abolished like gone it was absorbed completely into the islamic world the roman world however survived it was obviously an absolute chaos at the time but it survived so you can imagine the scene in Constantinople, in the capital, when there was a sudden influx of senior officials, provincial governors, and leaders and military commanders rushing into the imperial court with news of disaster. Disaster and devastation for the emperor Heraclius. Heraclius, the poor guy was still the emperor at the time. He had to suffer through two huge wars. So I couldn't imagine this. Like, he must have. Anyways. So at this point, like, well, there's a room full of officials. Everyone's this guy from Egypt, there's a guy from Palestine, there's a guy from like Thebes, there's a guy from this city, there's a guy from that city. They're all saying their city has fallen. Help, send troops, do something, do something. We're, we're in trouble, we're in trouble. They're like like crowds of people, lots of ships in the harbor and what's going on? Like there was complete chaos. Well, uh, there was a big war. And at the, well, at the very least, like <laughs> the Muslims were not able to fight and continue their conquest deep like Roman the Roman Empire did survive it survived because Anatolia wasn't able to be held they couldn't they couldn't hold it because there was a huge mountain range there it's called the Taurus mountain range and while well, the map doesn't it sort of cuts it but it's like this huge mountain range between Syria and what modern day Turkey is today and it's there's only basically two or three places where it could be crossed safely otherwise you just can't get through it so perfect places to set up some defenses you know, station troops on the on the on the mountain tops and just fired anyone who would come down and try to enter into those gates. So Romans were were able to hold that position, um, even if they were devastated. So at this point, a state of perpetual war or an eternal war began, which would last many centuries. 
The Muslims made the destruction of the Roman Empire sort of their primary goal at this point. And they called it, actually, they gave it a name. They called it uh, Dar el Harb, which would mean house of war. And then uh, they call themselves Dar al Islam, which I would say the house of submission or peace or whatever they want to say, call it, but um, for house of war. And within the house of war, killing, rape, enslavement was legal and encouraged. And we're going to see that this became uh, a tradition for them. This became something that they would do on a yearly basis. And there was a period of anarchy and chaos in the Roman, the Roman Empire. The government was not in order at all. Things were completely like half the provinces were gone at this point. Like, what are they going to do? So they needed to reorganize. So future emperors would actually, once everything settled, create like a, or, or enact some military reforms. They knew that they lost a lot of their territory, so they would reorganize their territory into new provinces. They called them the themes, and each theme would have its own uh, defensive and offensive army. And then on top of that, they'd have a main army, which is stationed around the capital. They got to protect the capital, and there's reasons for that. But it was to be it, that the main army was stationed around the capital. This was sort of the the, 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 the bulk of the Roman military reforms at the time. So they were holding down the fort, and they were not going to give up. And the following is a brief story of the persecutions and the ensuing events surrounding what just happened. Of course, the caliphate would then, the caliphate, what, what that new country we would say is called, I wouldn't call it a country per se, but like that's what the new, that's what it would be, without, that's what it would have been called, the caliphate, Khalifa. So, they would try the age old method of cutting the head off the snake. This was the first thing. Okay, we can't conquer them. Let's go for their capital. Let's make a beeline for the capital. So we obviously know that they were quite well, I wouldn't well. Anyways, in the seventh century and again in the eighth century, the Muslims made grand attempts on the capital. Of course, due to the defenses that we talked about, it's like the triple circuit wall, they were not able to breach the city. No way were they getting anywhere in near the city. So they were unsuccessful, but they were big attempts, like, like involved hundreds of thousands of soldiers. And the original, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, Hoga Detria icon, which is the icon of St. Mary, um, from St. Luke, the one that was painted by St. Luke, was in Constantinople at that time. And it was paraded every single time there was a siege of Constantinople, when the Muslims like besieged it, the icon was paraded on the walls to encourage the troops. And they were never let down by their eternal intercessor. So St. Mary sort of became the like de facto intercessor for Constantinople and for the Roman Empire. And this is, this is like their icon. This is like, they really, really revered St. Mary. So during the next 300 years, the Caliphate would organize several raids into the House of War every single year. Lots of booty, lots of slaves, loot, like money, money, literally like these guys, I, like, the Romans remember that they were the strongest economy at the time. We just talked about them having the highest GDP. So they, when they go in there, they're looking for statues. They're looking for gold, silver. They're robbing people. They're taking cities, which means they're sacking cities, which means they're going into houses. They're, they're looking into people's doors and, and uh, whatever. And the people, what are they doing to the people? They're taking them as slaves. They bring them back as slaves. Anyone who resisted uh, would be killed. Simple as that. that that's, that's what would be, well, that's what happened. It, it was devastating. It was, it was actually pretty terrible. Um, of course, the Romans were not just going to let this happen, right? They're not going to let people, foreign people, come in with swords and just have free reign in the territory. No, that, that wasn't going to be the case. So uh, the Romans devised actually a cunning solution to this to help the people defend themselves. Maybe the army wasn't as powerful as it was before and they couldn't fight off the huge Muslim armies, but they were still able to defend themselves. The people could still defend themselves and there, was, there were strategies. So have a, you guys have obviously all seen the Lord of the Rings, right? How many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings? <laughs> yeah, everyone, I'm, I'm sure. Like, so in the Lord of the Rings, uh, one, of the, one of the movies, there is the, the, the lighting of the beacons when there's like the big horde of, uh, you know, those monsters coming in. I don't know what they call, or, or, uh, orcs or something. So the big horde of orcs coming in and they wanted to warn like the big city the, the, with the big pointy thing. Um, yeah, they would, they, they lit up beacons to warn like the other, the other guys, hey, come and help us. These guys are coming. And this is what happened. This is like, this is exactly like 
what, like the Lord of the Rings thing. So you can imagine this happening like back then. So there was a series of beacons that led from like the front line all the way to the capital. This would be the main series, like big beacons like this. And then from that like sort of highway of beacons, you had like little streets moving into the territory. And these trees, once they see the beacon lit, they would light their own small beacons and they'd have like a string of beacons going to the cities, going to the towns, the villages, the, the citizens, just the normal like, you know, people living around and minding their own business. So they would get a warning and the capital would get a warning within minutes, say hours, hours from the front line to like, this is like thousands of kilometers and hours. This is crazy. Communication at all like, like at, well, not light speed, but very fast levels. So this is sort of what they did. As soon as they saw an army coming to raid them, they would light the beacons, the people would go and they would hide. And when the beacons were lit, the Romans, they hid in caves. So you guys obviously heard of the, well, maybe not, but you guys heard of the, the, the cave dwellings in Cappadocia. So these were a, a series of, of sort of cities or, or cave uh homes where people would go and escape to so when there was like a, an army coming through people would notice it or they'd notice the beacons and they'd go and live in places that looked a lot like this holes and caves essentially that's it i could imagine those holes in like the the you know the the back over there those probably like cupboards to put clothes and food and other you know, items but uh this is sort of how families lived in especially in like the like the places near to the frontier Year by year, for 300 years, the Muslims would come and the Romans would hide. And eventually, they actually just stayed in this, these cave dwellings. They just created cities in the mountains. And so we get cities like this in the mountains with caves as homes. And you would ask, where is the mighty Roman army now? Like, what are they doing? You're just like sitting back and doing nothing? No, they were, <laughs> they were doing something, but they stood no chance in a pitch battle against the Muslim army. They stood no chance at all. But they fought back and they made the trek into and out of the Roman Empire as treacherous as possible. They harassed the long column of soldiers, especially when moving into moving through the mountains where they can only move like at one like single file. They harassed it at the front, the back. They made sure that like they were they weren't going in like, like fear free and just like they had free reign over everything. No, nope, there is a strategy and a very smart strategy that sort of ensured their survival. But of course, um, the Roman weakness, you know, the fact that they cannot fight them directly meant casualties and uh, many martyrs, many people were killed for their faith. Again, the death toll, or I didn't even say, the death toll was staggering, staggering. And when I say staggering, I mean like in the millions, we're talking like the initial brunt of the war, which put like half the population of the Romans saw, the casualties of the military are estimated to be in the millions. So you can imagine the civilian casualties. I don't know, I don't know. So how about the Roman Christians, our ancestors that were all trapped behind them and enemy lines? So now we just sort of, you know, focus a lot on the Roman empire, just focus. Now we're gonna focus back. We're gonna look and see what happened behind the caliphate, in the caliphate. What were the rights? Well, we definitely know what they could not do. Well, not a lot of what they could do. Christians cannot mount a donkey. Or a horse. This is uh, one of the main, the, the, the well-known ones. Christians cannot bear weapons. Another one. They obviously didn't want people to rebel against the rule. Christians were not permitted to ring church bells, which was um, church ring, ringing church bells was common practice uh, during the Roman times. In some periods, crosses were not permitted to be displayed or adorn tops of church domes. You can imagine a city, not one cross in a, a Christian city, like ninety percent Christian, but not one cross in view anywhere, going from like a place where it had like thousands of crosses in view or so many, like you see nothing but crosses, it's a sea of crosses. That's intense. Christian basilicas and churches could not be larger than the grand mosques. This is the problem. This was a big problem. We know Justinian built a lot of big buildings and uh, there is a lot of big churches in the places that were conquered. In particular, there is St. John the Baptist Cathedral in Syria, in Damascus. We know that there is now a big mosque there, which was built using the material from this church. So the church was torn down, essentially. The Muslims said they bought it from the Christians. Sure. I would definitely believe that. 
yeah, they bought it, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> anyways, and it, but they were torn down and um, the material was used to build. And that's why if you go to really old mosques, you see all these columns, they look a lot like green and purple and red and blue Roman columns and like, oh, that's interesting. I saw something like that when I was in Rome. And say, oh, interesting. Oh, well. They came from somewhere. So the Christians were then, this is the big one. This is like the sort of the, like, it's like a shackle around your neck. They were forced to pay jizya with willing submission. So, and feel themselves subdued. This is not just, okay, just pay a tax and you're done. No, they had to pay and they paid to the governor in a, in a position of like, of inferiority. So they had to pay like while they're like on their knees or something like that, show themselves subdued. That's crazy. Like every Christian, like if you wanted to live, this is what you had to do. Otherwise you had to convert or they would fight. Like you'd be a rebel essentially to them. They, you'd be a rebel. Of course, they were rarely permitted to hold any position of power in the government. There are special cases, but this was the general rule. How about peace? Was there ever going to be peace between the Romans or the Christians, you know, which occupy the former Roman lands and uh, the Muslims? Well, only temporary and almost always broken by the Caliphate and always under the condition of payment of gold. So the, the peace, if you pay us, we won't fight you. That was the that was the condition, and we see this in history. And all of like you go through the history of the wars between the Caliphate, the, like the Arab Muslim, the, the Arab Roman wars, and you you realize that the only time there was peace is when the Romans were forking up a lot of gold, which uh, it's sort of like it feels a lot like this jizya tax in a way, like but on a grand government scale, like a overall like you know, a huge scale. And within the Caliphate, it was basically only oppression, persecution, destruction, rape, and murder. It was honestly only criminal. Like, it was really bad. The Roman army was nowhere to be seen, obviously. And there was really no one to rescue these people who were trapped. These are our ancestors at this point. The church within the Caliphate dug in. And there's good things to this, but persecution is still persecution no one's going to like it Contem the contemporaries are probably not having a great time um, of course their faith must have been pretty next level because they did not convert so no new churches no rebuilding churches houses of non-muslims must not be taller than houses of muslims this is another condition no crosses public feasts and celebrations were banned so you can celebrate easter in the streets or be vocal about it so many other rules. And if they are broken, so the Muslims impose something called a dimmi status, which is basically the agreement is you pay us this jizya tax and we will protect you in a way, you know, protect you, not killing you. Uh, and the blood of the accused is deemed halal when, where the death penalty is to be applied. Of course, like, you know, this is where I get like really emotional about this because it's, um, it's devastating. Like when you really think about what all these rules mean, like, especially in our modern day, if, if we couldn't do any of this stuff, like I'd probably explode. <laughs> so at one time, actually wine was banned and even like for Christian religious purposes, like, can you imagine? So they're telling us, yeah, don't even practice your most like sacred ritual. You're like, don't even practice the liturgy. Like, well. They weren't saying it directly, but I mean, when you when you start banning wine, uh, Christians were forced to follow a law of differentiation, where they wear something like something like a black belt and a black turban to distinguish themselves, and they had to wear a visible iron cross. So, okay, they can wear a cross, but this is not for you know for expression of their faith, which it, it is an expression of their faith. But this was for the Muslim government, the Islamic government. They, this was to to distinguish them in public to make sure that we know that you're Christian, then you should not be doing all of these things that we told you not to do. But even through all this, and this is the part which amazes me because this is un unheard of in history, unheard of. The conversion between from paganism to Christianity and the Roman Empire was like instant, almost like one generation, 320s to the 380s and the majority, the vast majority of Christians were, the Romans were Christian. But here, the Christians living under the Caliphate, were, they were not gonna convert. Non a million years. Well, some of them did. That's why it's sort of like it took centuries for the Muslim population to grow. But also that's why like many of us, like we're 10, 15% Christian in, in Egypt. This is after all of this persecution, but occupied Roman Egypt remained firmly Christian until the 14th century. This is 
over 50% Christian until 13 something. This is when they had a lot of Turkish, the Turks were, anyway, something we're going to talk about later, but <laughs> wow, the persecution from them was even like, like they, this is nothing yet, which is like devastating, but we have to get through this. So how do you improve your lot in life? Let's say you wanted to have a, like, you wanted to advance your career in the caliphate. What do you do? And you're a Christian. In the caliphate, you can improve your lot in life if you do one simple thing, just one simple thing. Convert to Islam. <laughs> that's it. That's the ticket out. One thing. And how do you convert? Just say one phrase with a witness and you're done. Like the simplest thing. You don't have to study. You don't have to spend a year doing this. You don't have to read any book. You just, one phrase. See how easy they made it? How easy. Like, you can't convert to Christianity like that. <laughs> what? You could receive a payment. For, by the way, they, they, there's financial incentives. So the government's giving out incentives. They gave you incentives. Hey, convert. Not only will we not kill you, we're going to give you money. So, like, so of course, a lot of, like, the, this, this was, in, like, unproportional in the way it devastated the population. Because many people, they could afford to pay, you know, they could afford to pay for, you know, the tax and everything. They, they, they sort of, you know, they kept their heads down and did what they needed to do. They went to church. And they kept quiet about everything. Uh, but a lot of people, they were poor and they couldn't afford the tax. They, the, like the lower runs of society, what, all, what other options did they have? So some of them were forced, not because they, maybe they, they, they didn't want to leave Christianity, but they were forced to set up their situation. Not only can you receive payments, you can achieve a higher status and levels in government in the society. So, you know, where you couldn't do something, well, now you could, and your kids, your family had better prospects. Who doesn't want to do something for their kids? You can ride a horse, donkey, if you wanted to. <laughs> the threat of death and persecution was relieved for the most part. And the list goes on. Those are the big ones. Many other perks were like, they were there to encourage people to convert peacefully from the conquered territories. So this worked for some people, but for the most part, people sort of saw through all the deception and saw through all the lies and the corruption and uh, the church was remained strong. The people, the, the people who converted fast, probably people in Syria near the frontier, because the devastation there was quite, you can imagine uh, fanatic soldiers being in that region who were you know, destined to cross into the territory of the Romans to go and, and launch a raid. They were living in Syria or maybe they spent a lot of time in Syria. So the persecution there must have been pretty big. So we know that the population in Syria became Muslim faster than the populations in like say Egypt, where it was much, much slower. Martyrs, now we're gonna talk a lot about, give, let's take some examples on like the people, the actual martyrs, the people who stayed in the, cal or who were in the caliphate and were killed for their faith. Well, we know there are innumerable martyrs, uh, but sometimes I always wonder, like we talk about the martyrs from like the, the, the Diocletian era, we talk about the early Christian martyrs very often, but how about the ones from like the Islamic era? If there's so many, why isn't the Synexarium just filled with these guys? Uh, well, there is an explanation for that. There are many mentions, so we know that. Uh, this is because there were people free enough and educated enough to write about those guys. So the people from Diocletian's era, well, there are other people writing about them, educated people, scholars who wrote about them, theologians who like wrote their histories, wrote down and copied their books and made sure that this thing survived, that, that their stories would live on so that we could know them today. And this is why we have a lot of these, we know a lot about these martyrs. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing is after the Muslim invasions, the persecution, the persecution was so heavy, not one Roman source from the 630s all the way to the 8th century. This is like almost two, well, almost 200 years of nothing in the literary sources, nothing in historical document. The Romans, it's like they wrote nothing. We know they wrote something, but all of their stuff was destroyed. It was gone. It's gone. The only thing that survives is going to be stuff from the caliphate, stuff that was hidden away, squirreled away. You know, like, like um, um, there's, there's, I don't remember his name. Was it, was a, he was a monk. A monk that wrote about the the Muslim invasions and was firmly opposed to it, and he he interpreted it as as um, a hair uh, like an extension of the Nestorian heresy. That's sort of what he saw. It. Anyways, um, that's something that survived, but there's very very little. That's that's not even like early. That's not even seventh century. It's like probably like the seven hundreds, sometime in the eighth century. So we don't know many names. We know some names. But we know that the death toll can be estimated in the many millions. 
We know that economic activity during this time plummeted, like plummeted. We can see this with the, the, the usage of lead. Essentially, in the medieval times, then the amount of lead in the atmosphere decreased drastically. And this is because there are not a lot of people to make lead pipes, um, lead basins, the things that you know that were used for running water and luxurious things. So that means you know, less people and also less civilization, less prosperity. Okay, so now let's discuss a few things. We're gonna we're gonna go back to the Roman Empire for a bit, and then we're gonna go into Egypt to discuss some of the, not just Egypt, the Caliphate, and discuss some of the the saints or the martyrs that exist that that were martyred during this time. Okay, first let's talk about Empress Irini. We know uh, this was an empress of the Roman Empire in the eighth century, and we know that she ceded territory to the Romans for peace. Not only did she cede territory to not to the Romans to the, the Caliphate for peace, not only did she cede the territory, she give an annual payment of gold and horses to the caliph for peace. So he's, she's paying for peace. She's like, we don't want to fight anymore. We'll do whatever. So the problem with that is Emperor Nikiforos, who was um, a former finance minister, took over after her and he was appalled by the situation, basically giving away a good sizable percentage of the GDP to our enemy or their enemy. Okay, how come, right? So the... <laughs> Well, he stopped the payments. And the caliph at the time was a powerful and brutal man by the name of Harun al-Rashid. And so he sent him a little note in flowing Greek. From Nikiforos, the emperor of the Romans, to al-Rashid, the king of the Arabs, as follows. The woman put you, your father, and your brother in the place of kids, kings, and put herself in the place of a commoner. I put you in a different place, and I am preparing to invade your lands and attack your cities unless you repay me what that woman paid you. Farewell. I guess it's a bit sexist. <laughs> the Caliph Harun al-Rashid responds in Arabic only, by the way. So you see the, the tension there. There's no translations. You need your own personal translator. In the name of God, the merciful, of the compassionate, from the servant of God, Harun, commander of the faithful, commander of the faithful, to Nikiforus, <laughs> the dog of the Roman. I mean, this is in Arabic, by the way, so it's much more uh, uh, vulgar in Arabic. As follows. I have read your letter and I have your answer. You will behold it with your own eyes, not read it. <laughs> so pretty crazy. So what did he do next? With that, Harun invaded the Roman Empire with a huge army. We're talking hundreds of thousands and laid waste to many cities, like a massive raid. This raid lasted like two years, like constantly. They dug in. Usually they go back home for the winter. They dug in in the Roman territory. They camped for winter. And they spent another year devastating the land. One of the worst wars, like one of the worst sort of situations at that time. Of course, well, what would he do when he conquered a city? Well, he destroyed the churches and he would build a mosque. In every city he conquered. Well, well, that's that's good. Uh, another example of the devast of a devastating invasion for the Romans was the sack of Amorium. This one, we know that um, uh, there, are, there, there are actually some named martyrs from this sack. And uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church actually venerates these guys. So in the early 1800s, there is an emperor by the name of Theophilus. And uh, he had some boldness. He thought he had, he had a bit of power. He thought he can play around with this big tiger to the south. So he launched an invasion into the Caliphate's borderlands with reasonable success. So he went in with his army, small army, whatever, but you know he did a bit of damage. The Caliph was furious at this development and he retaliated brutally. So again, he sent a letter to the Roman emperor clearly identifying his target. He's like, look, next year I'm coming over and I'm coming to your, your birthplace. I'm coming to the city where you were born. I'm gonna destroy it. <laughs> that's what he said. That's basically what he said. Um, yes, and that's what happened. Uh, but first, here's an interesting story. The emperor wanting to score a major victory. He, well, now that he sort of knew the plans of like the caliph, he sort of like, well, I could one up this guy. So he amassed a huge army. So the Caliph came in with 80,000 troops and the emperor came in and uh, well, he amassed 70,000 troops, 30,000 for the defense of the city, 40,000 for the, def like the, the, the fighting in the field. And he went with lots, he was so confident. He brought senior, all this, like most of the big senior officials, like the, like the, the second level in the government from the top, he brought all these guys um, like, and he even brought his family. He even brought his family and his and his kids. It's like, what? We're going to see a show or something. Mm -hmm. But so he brought them, 
and the fighting started and it was pretty bad. Like, and it turns out that, you know, so far a couple centuries of, 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 um, of war by the Caliphate gave them a lot of experience in fighting the Romans and the Romans were not ready. So they were defeated in the field and they retreated into the city. The city had great defenses. They had a nice long and a nice, really high, well, a nice tall circuit wall. And uh, they were able to hold up for a bit, but there was a traitor in the city. One person defected and, um, and told the, the invading army of a little passageway, like a, like a sort of a, a sewer, a weakness in the wall. So they went through, stormed the city, and they took it over, killed everyone, took a lot of people captive, took a lot of loot, and then obviously to make, you know, to, to put salt on the injury, or that's the expression, they destroyed it. They did not leave one stone standing to sort of, you know, a, a final, here you go, Emperor. I destroyed your, your, your birthplace because of what you did. It was you who did this, not me. That, that's sort of the message. Level to the ground. And the worst part of it all, those senior Roman officials who did not know what was coming for them, 42 of them, were taken captive back to the Caliphate. And after years of failed negotiations, subsequent emperors tried to like pay for the return, literally pay, ransom them, but nothing, nothing helped. And the Caliph ordered that they all be beheaded after they refused to convert to Islam. So remember, like, well, well, I say here, they spent seven years in captivity. You can imagine seven years in captivity. So over those seven years, they're probably repeatedly asked, look, you have these options, convert your prisons of war. So you, these are your options. You convert or you, you die. And they chose to die for the sake of Christ. And they are venerated in the Eastern Orthodox Church as like amazing, like great martyrs. They're called the 42 martyrs of Amorian to this day. So it's a pretty incredible story. Saint Dioscorus. So... This is another story. It's actually, I'll bring your attention to this very interesting book by Christian, Christian uh, Sahar. So he wrote a book on Christian martyrs under Islam, where he collects a lot of like historical records and sources and tries to piece together like what happened during this time, this time period. So you can find like names of martyrs and stories of martyrs that you've never heard of before. And actually, I'm going to go through a list of some of the names that I, that I was just looking into. So um, it, I do have a PDF of this book. Of this book. Um, it's not easy to find a PDF, but like if, if you're interested in reading it or taking a look at it, I can probably share it. Um, but uh, it's also available like, you know, all over the place. So it won't be hard to get a copy of it. So St. Discourse was, you know, just a Christian guy who was living in the Caliphate and he was brought up Christian, like his family was Christian. But then when he was older, he converted to Islam. His sister found out about this. His sister was living somewhere else. They were like living apart and sent him a sorrowful and heartfelt letter. So upon receiving this letter and reading it, he sort of snapped out of it. He's like, what did I do? How come, how did I do this? So they, they sort of found him in the streets, just roaming around. And I'm not sure what sort of led the government officials to sort of um, come on that you know, this guy is just, you know, uh, renounced his Islamic faith. Maybe he was screaming it. I have no idea what he was doing. It was not written. Uh, he was brought before the Muslim governor and eventually he was burned alive for what he did. And this is a direct sort of, in, um, like here, it says the messenger of Allah said, whoever changes his religion, kill him. And here he means his Islamic religion. So you sort of a one-way street. You go one way, you're good, <coughs> but there's no coming back from it. So uh, this is an example of what happened from that. Saint Discorus, um, I don't think he's in the sense, he's definitely not in the sense. I just know, oh no, he is. He is in the sense area. Actually, he is in the sense area. Okay, we can find his story in the sense area. Obviously, this is in the sense area. The moving of the mountain. So now we're moving into some familiar territory. We all know about Pope Abraham and uh, Simon the Tanner and their story about, you know, the fasting for three days and how, um, if you have, faith as, a, as a small as a mustard seed, you will say them on move from here to there. And move. So I'm not going to go through the story, but this is one of the most incredible expressions of the Christian faith in, in the occupied territory. So Pope Abram, he was the 62nd Pope after a two-year vacancy. This was during a period of turmoil. The, so the Fatimid government uh, was ruling at that time. And there's a lot of persecution during that time. There's a, we're going to explain the reason later, but just to give you a hint, it's because the Romans were making some pretty big advances. They were liberating a lot of territory in the north and revenge, essentially, just 
there's paranoia. They wanted revenge. So where did they go for revenge? The Christians within their territory. So Caliph, the, the Caliph al Moiz challenged the Pope because there was like a Jewish governor and they were debating, look, the Christians have this verse. Why don't you, you know, take, take it up, take up, uh, take him up on it. So the, the Caliph challenged the Pope and his church with this verse. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there and it will move from Matthew 17, 20 and also Mark eleven twenty three. 23. So there is an involvement of three days of prayer and fasting. Obviously this was devastating news because if they didn't do this, there would be a huge wave of persecution against the Christians. They'd go on a killing spree. That was sort of the intent. Um, so three days of prayer and fasting and the involvement of St. Simon the Tanner. We're not going to go over the story. We all know it. It's a really long story. I have it in my notes, but I'm not going to. It's really long. And the mountain moved and the caliph converted. And this is true. This is, this is true. Like literally, it, geographically speaking, there's evidence. Historically speaking, there's evidence. Like this is actually true. And I actually studied this. I sort of like went through all the details. This is legit. And uh, it's scary because the caliph who converted, he's gone from the historical record. The Islamic historical record, nothing is mentioned about him. He didn't exist. He's gone. <laughs> so, uh, but we know he's like, he did become a monk and he, he is you know, buried in, I think one of the monsters, I'm not sure, but like he converted a caliph. Like that's insane. That's unheard of. In fact, this is unheard of. This is like the only instance that we know of. So um, that's one of the most exp incredible expressions of faith in occupied Egypt. So martyrs, martyrs, martyrs. The practice of beheading became a national sport almost for the caliphate. Here are some of the names of the people that suffered this fate. Uh, they became martyrs for the sake of Christ. These are the names that you, you might have heard of, you might not have heard of. These are names from that book. Examples. George the slave. He was a, a Muslim slave and he'd be converted to Christians. He killed him. Vahin of Golden. He was actually Armenian. Abdel Messiah, probably from Egypt. <laughs> Kiros of Haran, Elias of Heliopolis. Heliopolis is in somewhere in Syria. David of Dwin, I think also in Armenia, and Prefectus the monk. Prefectus was in the in the west. Probably in uh, I don't actually don't remember, so I'm not gonna say anything wrong. So um, you only real like at this point, you know, if you're a Christian and you're in the caliphate, you were not safe from persecution at any level. Your only real solace just had to come from Christ. Like there's no one else. And the church, of course, the community that was the church, that's all the Christians had at that time. Christ and the church, and that's it. That's what they could hold on to. And that's exactly what they did. We could, well, we know it because we're here today, sitting here, surviving in Coptic church and we're one of the ones with the strongest faith and, um, and so on and so forth. But now we talk about catastrophe and division so actually, we're, we're, we're coming to the, we have like maybe five or six slides left. So we're, we're not, we're almost done. It's a catastrophe and division. Wait, but the Roman Empire is growing. Why is this a catastrophe? Well, it's not a catastrophe for the Romans. They were prospering. They were, they were doing great. They liberated Armenia, Anatolia, and Syria, and even a little bit of Palestine. And they made, a, they, made a, they made an attempt at Jerusalem. They weren't able to take it, but they were there. So they were, they were doing pretty well for themselves. Of course, something had to blow that up, but we're not going to get to that. The problem is paranoia grew within the caliphate. And this is when you had a, the Fatimid persecution. It's a huge weight. Thousands of churches were destroyed. Thousands of churches. Most notably, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Sepulchre. I can't even pronounce it. The Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Destroyed. Destroyed. Like, that's like one of the holiest places in, uh, like, the holiest churches. Destroyed. Gone. So, yeah. The, although the Romans are doing well, this came at a cost for the, 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 those left behind, behind enemy lines, which would be our, our ancestors. And this is where we get a lot of stories. This is where the moving in the mountain. During this time, that's when the moving in the mountain occurred. Crazy, like absolutely crazy. Of course, the good times did not continue for the Romans and a new player appeared from the Far East, the Turks. It's like, you know, when the boss comes in, like it says new boss or something on the game. Uh, <laughs> this is like, this is the next one. So, whoa, a lot of white. What happened? Okay. A decisive battle was fought at Manzikert. Uh, Manzikert is a city somewhere in the east. And uh, obviously, you know that the Romans were defeated. And it wasn't just defeat. The enemy captured the emperor. Captured. This happened like maybe three, three other times in history, in like 2,000 years of history. Captured the emperor. 
whoa, the government must have been into, and it was in turmoil. Like it was completely, it's like the chaos that existed in the seventh century, repeated all over again. And hence, Anatolia is gone, came under the control of the Muslim Turks. In addition, just before this event, there is the Great Schism. You guys know about the Great Schism in 1054, where the Catholic Pope or Bishop uh, of Rome publicly excommuted the Bishop of Constance or the Patriarch of Constantinople inside of the Hagia Sophia itself during the liturgy. He interrupted the liturgy. He came in, put a letter of excommunication on the altar during the liturgy and walked out with his delegates. How rude is that? Anyways, see, that's the mentality that was going through their minds. That's why the schism is so great because it was the event that precipitated it. It's just a, like a disaster. Like it's, um, that's so rude. <laughs> see, like, okay. So let's skip over. I'm going into another tangent. The new emperor, Alexius, which is came after, you know, the time of turmoil, uh, was in a pickle. He needed reinforcements and he needed them fast. And he had no choice but to turn to the West. I mean, where's he going to get his reinforcements? He, what did he have in his control now? Very little, just all the Western parts and not even that. So he needed reinforcements. So the Crusades, so how many of you believe that the Crusades were uh, an offensive part on the side of Christendom? It's like Christianity being offensive. I don't. So defensive? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> oh, thank defensive is true. It is a defensive thing. So this is why we have the Crusades. It was not an attack on Islam or Islamic lands. It was an act of defense. It was meant to be an act of liberation, actually. The original purpose of the Crusades was to restore Roman lands, not for the Catholic kings to carve out kingdoms of their own. And uh, that's exactly what they ended up doing. They carved kings and kingdoms of their own and didn't give any of the land back to the Roman empires. Well, they gave some, but not all of it. They wanted their own wealth. They wanted their own country. They wanted to rule in their own right. So now we have persecution from two fronts. Here's a map of the, uh, of some of, or the Crusades, basically all the Crusades up to the fourth. You can see uh, their past as they go from Europe all the way to the Middle East and where, which territory they took. They did help in taking back these territories around here, which they did actually give back to the Romans, uh, but the rest, the kingdom of Jerusalem, for example, was actually under one of the crusader kings. So persecution now came from two fronts. Now there's occupied territories by the Caliphate and occupied territories by the Catholic kings. And the Catholic Christians sort of regarded the Orthodox practices as odd, extreme, and mysterious. And at times, persecution would be even worse, like from the Catholic Christians than from the Muslims. Of course, again, there is more paranoia and revenge in the Islamic world against Christians, and Egypt sort of always, always gets the short stick. So there's a lot more persecution happening in Egypt during this period. Now we get in, uh, well, now we can go a little bit deep into, well, no, sorry. Now we go deep into each and every, uh, now that, we, what did I, <laughs> I have no idea what I wrote in my notes. That was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to cue my brain, not, not distract me anyways. So we went deep in a lot of different aspects, but not too deep, but we could go deep into each one of those things. We could go very deep into each one of these, the, the time frames, each one of these events, the saints that we described, like this is a whole topic. Each one of those is a whole topic on its own, like a five hour topic, but obviously we won't, we don't have time for that. So um, we're going to stick to our high level overview of all this, uh, but there's definitely so much more. So I really encourage everyone to really research, like maybe uh, like anything that's stuck, just go out and try to find, find out more information about it. There's a lot of great resources actually. Um, and, and a lot of good podcasts these days too. So like this, you won't be short on anything. So, um, to, the, to end the medieval era, there was one major event, one that to this day is celebrated in the Islamic world as their greatest victory. This is like their epitome. This is the best thing that ever happened. And they call this event the defeat of Christianity, the taking of the seat of Christianity or opening Constantinople. And this is, of course, as we know it, the fall of Constantinople to the Muslim Turks on May 29, 1453. Here are some images depicting this event. And of course, as you know, soon after the fall, the Hagia Sophia, uh, well, they, they have minarets erected around it like that. And it, it, right after it would be converted into a mosque. So yeah, that happened. 
So we know that the Crusades could not stop the Muslims and in fact devastated the Romans. The Romans cannot withstand the cost and attacks and more citizens whom we now call Greeks today fell under the control of the Muslim rulers. Finally, the Muslims captured the capital and the devastating of this capture alone would probably be enough to send shivers down our spines, more shivers than we've already sent down our spines. Um, but I think we've had enough about that. So we should probably end this on a high note. You know, let's end this discussion on a high note. First, uh, well, these persecutions were never in vain. I mean, Christ sort of promised in the way, like he did promise that we would be persecuted and we'd be killed for his sake. This was sort of like, we should have expected this. So martyrdom is martyrdom, a crown is a crown, and a struggle is a struggle. There's nothing wrong with being killed for the sake of Christ. Of course, for the contemporaries, for the people like, you know, someone's family, if my son was killed for, for professing Christ, I'd be devastated, of course. Um, if someone I knew was killed, I'd be devastated. I'd mourn, of course, I'd be sorrowful, but I'd be angry at times. I'd want to rebel. It happened. There were rebellions. But of course, that's just our own fallen reaction of it because we we just we might have a uh, so there were millions upon millions of martyrs during the medieval era. The martyrs were also not in vain because without the Roman Empire and the steps that led to its conquests. So the steps that led to 1453. What happened just after it, like right after this, and maybe just before it, would not like like if that didn't happen, if that if like this event didn't happen we would not be here today. We'd literally be in a completely different world. And this is the Renaissance. Of course, we know that, well, the Renaissance is a spectacular time period where there's sort of a rebirth of fascination with science and technology and, all, and arts and all of this in the Western, the Western sphere. So they sort of like came out of their own medieval, their dark ages in a way. Uh, well, we know why. Like the people who sort of um, ignited this, the people who ignited this movement was a flock of Roman refugees escaping the Turkish invasions. Literally, the most brightest people in the Roman in the Roman country, in the Roman period, they took all their books, they took all their possessions, and they just got on a ship and they went west. Where did they find um, a place to stay? In Italy. And that's where the Renaissance sort of exploded. So we sort of have all of that to thank for, for our existence and our livelihood and our civilization today. Um, not only that, but the preservation of our ancient heritage, our, the Eastern churches was fueled by its need to dig in and survive. The focus on was not on like changing the dogma, you know, uh, getting soft, saying, why do we have to fast? Why can't we just make it like, uh, I don't know, give up chicken? Uh, maybe just not eat chocolate or something. It's like th things like that weren't the primary mode. Like it wasn't even like coming to their minds. They were focused on surviving. They wanted to live. They wanted, didn't want to get killed <laughs> for the most part. You know, like there are those who were called to martyrdom and for them, like they, they, they've gained the crowns and we asked for their prayers, but you know, I'm sure a whole people didn't want to get killed. So the focus was on staying alive, not changing traditions, while the Western churches, unimpeded by persecution, changed and got softer. The Eastern churches were put into a, sort of a pickle jar and they were preserved for millennia, basically like one and a half millennia into the modern day. And to the uh, and of course, for their success and uh, or because of their well, and two, first their success, then their survival. We owe our existence through the grace of our of the Almighty Creator, our modern day existence today. And that's all I have for for us today. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I don't know how, do how you doing? Stop trying. Yeah. Just. <laughs> yeah, stop trying. Thanks, guys. That was great. <laughs> okay, cool.